I'd like to start to welcome everyone to our SED webinar on a methodology for gender mainstreaming in the EU budget. Uh, the Socialists and Democrats, the SED group, and in the end of the day, the European Parliament fight for the promotion of the gender equality as an horizontal principle in the framework of the pluriannual EU budget, the MFF 21-27. But it was, and it is clear for us, that principle is not enough. We must ensure long-term improvements on gender equality. It's why, on equality between men and women, the promotion, implementation, and monitoring of relevant programs and the mainstreaming including gender impact assessments and the development of a methodology to measure the relevant expenditure at programs level was introduced. It's why we are here today in this political debate. I thank first the panelists, Commissioner, General Director for Budget in the European Commission, OECD and the European Agency for Gender Equality officials. But also, I thank all the participants coming from different organizations, from different countries, to be here with us to debate this so important subject. I'll start, as usual nowadays, with some technicalities. You can listen to and speak in English or French. A Q&A session follows. All the participants can, since now, either ask the floor by raising your hand or in the chat, or write your question in the chat. When the floor will be given to you, you must press your speak button down in your screen. So, without any further delay, I give now the floor to Hélène Fritzen, Swedish MEP and Vice President of the SED Group, who, on behalf of the SED Group, will welcome all of you to our webinar. Hélène, please, the floor is yours for five minutes. Thank you so much, uh, Margarida. Uh, and uh, I'm in Stockholm, and I'm very pleased to be with you today and to warmly welcome you all to this important webinar on gender mainstreaming in the European Union budget. We have had an interesting program ahead of us, and we are going to listen to many excellent speakers today. But before we start, I would like to give you a picture. I would like to tell you about my granddaughter. She is a curious seven-year-old uh, who just started school. Like all children, she should have a future full of opportunities in front of her. But if we continue uh, at the current pace, she will be 67 years old when the European Union has reached gender equality. 67 years, that means she will probably live her entire adult life with a lower salary than her male colleagues. She will not have the same possibilities to be part of decision making, and she will be at greater risk for being exposed to gender based violence. The pandemic, the pandemic has most likely not shortened the time it will take to reach gender equal European Union. EU uh, research from AGE and Eurofund show that the social and economic impacts of the COVID-19 crisis threaten, uh, threaten to roll back recent progress in gender equality. Maybe, maybe my seven-year-old grandchild will never experience gender equal European Union at all. And therefore, for the S&D group, gender equality is a top priority. We fight for equal pay and pension, equal access to the labor market and career opportunities, and a life free from fear, sexual harassment and violence. Gender equality 
is also one of the European Union's fundamental values, and we finally have a gender equality strategy with common goals. But fundamental values and strategies do not automatically result in gender equality. All commitments must translate into concrete policies and allocation of resources. Gender mainstreaming and gender budgeting must be integrated in all policy and processes. And uh, we know about the climate transition as one example is no exception. Girls and women should um, uh, around the world are harder hit by clim climate change. And yet women are underrepresented in decision making. The future of our planet is at stake and it, um, it affects every one of us. To do the clim climate transition, to achieve the European Union's uh, climate goals, to make a green transition that is just and inclusive for all. And to do that, we must integrate a gender equality perspective when decisions are made and resources are distributed. Gender budgeting is not only an important tool for gender equality, it is necessary that we use it if we want to achieve our gender equality objectives and build a strong and sustainable Europe. It must be part of every budget process from the very start. So today we will uh, examine state of the art practices when it comes to gender mainstreaming and how to develop a, a methodology to me uh, measure gender expenditure, including the promotion of gender mainstreaming in the MFF. Let us keep the children in our minds when we talk about these important uh, issues, because my seven-year-old granddaughter and the rest of the children around Europe should not have to wait 60 years for gender equality and equal opportunities. Gender equality is not just a woman's or girl's issue. It benefits everyone and our society and must be at heart of our work. So again, I really look forward and I will say warm welcome to everyone to this meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Ewan, for your uh, inspiring uh, words. Um, and uh, as you remember, gender equality is a key ambition and uh, a key policy in the, European Parliament, in the European Union. The European budget is the privileged instrument for turning words into actions. The SED group wants to see gender equality enshrined not only as a horizontal principle, this is an acquis since a long time ago, but as a practice in all the European policies and the member states. Of course, gender equality has not yet been achieved in practice. As I said in the beginning, we demand it in the decision on the MFF 21-27. And now, we will do everything to make this commitment a reality. The European Commission has still to develop a methodology for the application of gender mainstreaming in the EU budget. The purpose of this webinar is in fact to assess how in the light of the new MFF framework, 2001-2027, and the next generation EU, we can actually reduce the inherent gender inequalities that exist in many policy areas and countries, often reinforced through decisions on how public resorts, European money in this case, are allocated and used. We have a huge responsibility on the spending, spending of the European money. In November 2020, in the MFF negotiations, the Parliament achieved the introduction of equality between men and women as a new horizontal principle of the EU budget. In the interinstitutional agreement, we were able to push further and the Parliament secured the design of a methodology to measure gender expenditure, including promotion of gender mainstreaming. 
The Commission has committed to examine how to develop a methodology to measure gender-relevant expenditure at program level and to use this, that methodology as soon as it is available. This way, we want to ensure that gender equality considerations are systematically taken into account when a single euro of the EU budget is spent. That the methodology is developed and implemented, that the methodology is sound, transparent, and credible. In addition, we want that by 2027 and at the end of the current MFF, we will know exactly how the European money was spent to reduce gender inequalities and how gender equality was promoted. In the recent European Court of Auditors report, the special report on gender mainstreaming in the EU budget, time to turn words into action. The Court concluded that the Commission's strategy for gender equality had not yet been realized. Thanks to the rapporteur, but also a later word to Judge João Figueiredo, unfortunately no longer with us. I know he was also an activist on this topic. The court found that in the 2014-2020 MFF, only 21.7% of the EU programs had gender-related indicators. This is 236 billion out of the 1,087 billion. This is unacceptable for us. We want to make sure we know how the 1.8 trillion euros of the current MFF and the next generation EU are spent in policies that are promoting gender equality and regressing inequalities practices. The court recommended that the Commission systematically collect, analyze, and report on existing sex disaggregated data for the EU funding programs, use gender related objectives and indicators to monitor progresses, develop a system for tracking funds allocated and used to support gender equality and report annually on the results achieved in terms of gender equality. I know we have participants from the European Court of Auditors today. I hope we will hear from you on the debate later on. As we know, gender mainstreaming and gender budgeting are current practices in some EU member states. Generating awareness of how policies included in the budget impact people differently and addressing equality promotion. In fact, under the National Recovery and Resilience Plans, we are demanding to know how member states spend their money in order to reduce gender inequalities and promote gender equality. We believe that a webinar on the state of the art methodologies for gender impact measuring is a good and timely kickstart. We need to reflect, discuss, and decide on moving forward. We have in our hands the highest overall budget of the EU history. Let us make sure that the MFF, Next Generation EU, Recover and Resilience Facility, and all EU financial reserves consider gender from now on. So, now I give the floor to Commissioner Elena Dali. Thank you very much to be here with us. And I'd like to welcome you 
Um, and uh, I move, uh, I give the floor to you for eight minutes, if possible. Thank you very much, Commissioner. The floor is yours. Thank you and good morning. I hope you can hear me. Yes. Yes. Okay, good. So, uh, gender equality is a core value of the EU, a fundamental right and key principle of the European pillar of social rights. So from the start of President von der Leyen's mandate, the Commission has been fully committed to promoting gender equality. Through the launch of the gender equality strategy, gender mainstreaming has been key in all EU internal and external policy areas and initiatives, including in matters related to budget and financial tools. Thanks to the creation of the Equality Task Force, the Commission ensures all policy initiatives are as conducive as possible to gender equality. One of the most recent examples in this year's updated Better Regulation Guidelines to ensure that ex-ante impact assessment of all relevant spending programs duly consider the effects of gender equality. Gender equality and mainstreaming will only advance if we all prioritize and implement such an approach. Thanks to the agreement of the Parliament and the Council in giving the Citizens' Equality, Rights and Values Programme an additional 912 million euros, the allocated 1.5 billion euro budget represents the biggest ever support to fundamental rights inside the EU. The 2021-2027 multi-annual financial framework promotes gender equality through dedicated gender equality actions and programs, such as the Daphne Strand of the SERF program. Other major programs, such as Erasmus+, Plus, European Social, Social Fund+, Plus, or even programs whose principal objective is not promoting equality, include provisions for strengthening and mainstreaming gender equality. Furthermore, 85% of all new actions throughout external relations will be gender responses, with 5% of them having gender as principal objective under the Gender Action Plan 3. In order to improve measures, the Commission services are working on a systematic equality data catalogue to identify available information as well as potential data gaps so that we can, in due course, carry out an assessment of the effects that EU financing has had on gender equality. In line with the interinstitutional agreement accompanying the 2021-2027 multi-annual financial framework, the Commission is developing a methodology to measure the contribution of each relevant program to gender equality. Our plan is to test this methodology on some programs in 2022 and use it for reporting as of 2023. Also, as part of the EU's recovery and resilience facility, the financial tool to rebuild our economies, the Commission asked Member States to put gender equality at the heart of its national recovery plans. We have observed some positive contributions to the national plans, with, for instance, significant investments in childcare facilities and long-term care. Recently, the European Court of Auditors, as you have already mentioned, published a report on gender mainstreaming in the EU budget. The Commission shares the ambitions set out in this special report and agrees that we can improve our work based on the shortcomings identified in several areas concerning gender equality in the 2014-2020 multi-annual financial framework. In order to do so, and as highlighted to the European Court of Auditors, we need to identify the best methodology to implement some of the necessary steps. The work done on the MFF, the RFF, or specific spending programs 
are all critical steps to inspire us for future spending. And financial frameworks, by identifying and building our best practices and setting clear objectives, indicators and targets for gender equality. I thank Margarida and Ada for their work on the RFF and the MFF. We need to continue translating our political priority of gender equality into concrete actions. Together, we can make important contributions towards promoting gender equality in the EU and beyond, and ensuring that thanks to a fair allocation of resources, all women and girls in all their diversity can equally lead, thrive, and be free. I thank you. Thank you, Commissioner, uh, having shared with us your goals as Commissioner in charge of uh, equality. Uh, and uh, uh, thank you also to share with us your uh, points and your uh, priorities. Uh, and uh, we know that uh, we can uh, work together uh, with you on uh, how to improve gender uh, budgeting. Uh, so now I move to uh, Mr. Gertian Koopman. Uh, Gertian is the Director General for Budget in the European Commission with uh, specific responsibilities and also uh, Mr. Koopman uh, were, was with us during the MFF negotiations when we took uh, some uh, compromises. So, uh, as Director General for Budget, uh, you will be responsible for developing and implementing a gender mainstream methodology as agreed in the MFF decision and the interinstitutional agreement no later than January 2023. Gertien, please, the floor is yours for eight minutes. Good uh, morning, uh, Margarita. Uh, good morning, colleagues. Uh, I am delighted to have been invited to the seminar, which uh, indeed picks up on a very important theme, which uh, you yourself uh, uh, have managed uh, to put uh, very prominently in the interinstitutional agreement on uh, the uh, MFF, and which, as recalled by previous speakers, is actually of fundamental importance uh, to the Union. Um, we in uh, DG Budget uh, are, of course, tasked with uh, taking forward a number of important elements uh, in this context, and I'm very happy today to tell you a little bit about uh, where we stand with, with some of this. If we can go to the next slide, uh, I would like uh, simply to echo what uh, Commissioner Daly uh, has already said about uh, the priority which uh, the von der Leyen Commission attaches to gender uh, equality. Uh, she herself is the first uh, commissioner uh, for uh, uh, equality uh, and uh, the creation of a dedicated task force uh, is also testimony to the importance we attach to the subject, as is the 2020-2025 gender equality strategy. Of course, it is clear that gender equality is a fundamental value and principle uh, of the EU, but it is also an economic uh, uh, requirement, an opportunity for all of us to advance uh, uh, the well-being of all of our citizens and to, on the back of that, also have a wider economic uh, uh, benefit for, for society at large. So gender equality from many different perspectives is important and a lot of work is still uh, to be done going forward, uh, particularly uh, in the budget. And uh, if I can have the next slide. I would like to emphasize two elements in this context. First, the importance of gender mainstreaming, where, let me be very honest, we are at the start of um, what I hope will be a productive journey towards better mainstreaming, which effectively would require the integration of a gender perspective into all the different aspects of the budgetary uh, cycle, not just the design and preparation of programs, but also, and I think that's really critical, the implementation and later on the monitoring and evaluation. Now, secondly, uh, as uh, referred to by uh, Mrs. Marquez, the 
introduction of a gender mainstreaming uh, approach is recognized uh, in the interinstitutional agreement. And a key feature of this uh, naturally is the uh, importance of actually tracking and tracing uh, expenditure uh, in uh, uh, the MFF. I'll say more about that because I think uh, that ultimately measuring very concretely what is done, being able to uh, monitor it, to evaluate it, and then to assess it is critical. What measures gets done normally. Before getting to that, however, if I can have the next slide. Next slide, please. I would like to refer to a number of other uh, important strands uh, in the context of the in uh, in the context of the uh, EU budget, notably the updating of the better regulation uh, guidelines, which of course means that our impact assessments uh, will uh, uh, duly consider the effects uh, on uh, gender equality. That's very important. It's something for the long haul because obviously this relates to commission proposals uh, that are accompanied by impact assessments. It will then go uh, into the uh, decision-making process between Council and Parliament, and it's only uh, when the final result is turned into law and then put into action in the budget that the results of these uh, efforts will be made. But gender equality, as uh, uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Hélène Fritzon rightly pointed out, is a, is a matter of the long haul. Now, secondly, uh, and I come to that, uh, the tracking of gender expenditure at program level is, uh, is critical. Uh, I will say much more about that later. And then, you know, we actually have a dedicated program such as the uh, Daphne Strand of the Citizens' Equality, Rights and Values program, which, uh, as Commissioner Daly uh, recalled, uh, as a result also of uh, Parliament's uh, insistence, was significantly increased. This has a, uh, a very significant impact in terms of having uh, tools in the budget that really target uh, gender equality. We're also working on building a systematic data catalogue that allows us uh, to identify available information and data gaps so that we can, on that basis, uh, have a much better empirical basis going forward for assessing the effects of EU financing on gender equality. And finally, maybe it is a little bit uh, practical and uh, operational, but I, I, I would like to really pay a tribute to the work of AIGA and the European University Institute who are assisting us with uh, setting up specialized training programs for staff. At the end of the day, uh, if we are to take this seriously, we need to equip our colleagues with the necessary skills and tools, and that's why this training program is really important. So as you see, we are working on laying the foundations. We are taking a long-term perspective. This is not something that will be achieved tomorrow. It will not even be achieved at the end of uh, uh, this budgetary cycle. It's something that we have to anchor in uh, 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 the uh, budgetary uh, approach uh, for the very long haul, resulting obviously in very concrete steps uh, that are taken, allowing Parliament Council to monitor progress. Now, if you allow me, next slide, please, to say a word about our tracking methodology. As I said, what gets measured normally gets done. Therefore, this is really, I think, very critical. We apply uh, uh, the tracking approach uh, to uh, many important policy priorities, such as the fight against climate change, uh, biodiversity, uh, and I think gender clearly needs to be brought to a similar level of maturity in terms of uh, tracking uh, uh, in the budget. Now, obviously, if we talk about the contribution the EU budget makes to gender equality, uh, in reality, as this slide shows, this is a, an amalgamation of the contribution of different programs. Some programs, this is purely illustrative, as you can see, like program one in this example, will contribute a lot Others are much uh, uh, less uh, 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 significant from a gender equality perspective, such as in this example, program two. But we need to look at that very uh, systematically to come to a meaningful uh, uh, overall judgment on the contribution the EU budget uh, brings. And as already recalled, we will start, as per the IIA agreement, uh, with uh, an approach based at uh, program level looking uh, in the first instance at those programs we manage uh, ourselves uh, directly. So if we go to the next slide, uh, we will uh, 
be uh, pushing forward the tracking uh, uh, through the development of a methodology um, which uh, we have committed to uh, should be uh, available for centrally uh, managed uh, programs uh, on a selective basis in 2023. Now, given the importance uh, of this matter, and also in light of what was said about possibly the effects of the crisis on gender equality, we are trying in DG Budget to advance this, uh, to speed up uh, the work so that maybe uh, we will already next year be able to show some uh, first results. And I would like to keep Parliament uh, and uh, the uh, colleagues who work more particularly on this fully uh, involved uh, in this matter. So we hope that uh, uh, today's meeting uh, is uh, part of an, an ongoing dialogue with uh, uh, the uh, protagonists of gender uh, uh, budgeting going forward. We have the next slide, uh, please. Um, I would like maybe to say a word about the recovery and resilience facility to, to which uh, Ms. Marquez already referred. Obviously, um, that's a, a, a huge spending program uh, which uh, should lay the foundations for a durable uh, 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 and resilient recovery. And we have tried uh, uh, in the design of the RRF and Parliament has in the negotiations on the RRF, uh, strengthened this to uh, anchor gender mainstreaming in this program as well. So the plans uh, uh, need to explain uh, uh, how uh, uh, they contribute to uh, gender equality and equal opportunities for all. Whilst you know, that requirement is uh, uh, important, I, I, I must personally say that I'm not uh, fully satisfied uh, uh, as a citizen uh, 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 with, with the extent to which this subject has been covered extensively. But I am hopeful that as we uh, look at the results, uh, based on uh, reporting requirements that will be laid down in a delegated act, we will nevertheless, even if it's imperfect, have uh, uh, a a uh, good uh, uh, first uh, uh, example of a centrally managed program of critical importance uh, that uh, contributes to gender equality because we will, for the first time, have um, a, a tracking uh, a system that will give us some information about the impact on, on gender equality. So the RRF should be seen, in my view, as a first important step, but clearly it is only a, a, a first step at this juncture. Which brings me maybe at, to my last slide, which gives you um, an overview of the uh, long path uh, of uh, uh, advancing gender mainstreaming in the EU budget. You can see the road travelled since uh, uh, December 2019, when Mrs. Daly was appointed as the first Equality Commissioner. The appointment of the Equality uh, Task Force in January 2020 and the adoption of the uh, Gender Equality Strategy 2020-2025, which was uh, completed on uh, the 5th of uh, March uh, 2020. Then uh, uh, I think the interinstitutional agreement, as far as the budget is concerned, really marks a very important uh, uh, anchor uh, uh, and milestone, which uh, uh, was, of course, uh, uh, achieved in December of last year. And the delivery on the commitments uh, under this uh, uh, agreement has started this year with the communication on better regulation, which referred to the importance of integrating uh, gender in uh, impact assessments. That was done in uh, 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 April of this year. We uh, are uh, planning, as I said, to test the gender equality tracking methodology uh, uh, next year, and we have committed to applying it by 2023, uh, even if uh, I have just said that we will try to do what we can to advance matters, at least on uh, a, a, a selected uh, basis. Which brings us then to the uh, uh, review in uh, 2024 that should teach us uh, what uh, is working and inform the direction of travel going forward. I hope to have underlined our very strong commitment here in DG Budget to this strategy, we see it as something for the long haul. We know we're in here for something that will really contribute not just to values, but also to prosperity 
and we're strongly committed to realizing it in practice. Thank you very much. Merci, uh, Gertiane. Je voulais vraiment remercier... Uh... Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hert. I'd like to thank you very much for your presentation. I must say that it wasn't the thorniest of issues and that it wasn't the most difficult to agree upon within the MFF negotiations, but it's true that we face an enormous challenge in order to turn a political commitment between the European institutions into reality if we are to really make sure that the European budget can really promote uh, gender equality and uh, if we want to promote gender budgeting. So thank you very much for your presentation. I'm very sure that uh, we'll be discussing many of the issues that you raised during the debate. So now I'm going to give the floor to the OECD expert. I'd like to thank Mr. Jan Blondal for taking part in this seminar. The OECD has made a lot of progress uh, when it comes to its debate on gender budget methodology. And therefore, I'd like to give the floor to Jon Blondal so that he can share uh, the progress that the OECD has accomplished uh, on the issue of gender budgeting. The floor is yours, sir. Mr. Blondel, you can please press the speak button at the bottom of the page. Can you hear me now? Yes, please. Yes. Okay. <laughs> sorry, I, we've been having some technical problems today, and I'm sorry that I'm only joining you by audio. But it's uh, thank you very much, uh, Margarita, for uh, your introduction. Uh, thank you very much to the S&D group for the invitation and to all the speakers and all the delegates joining us. Uh, I am very pleased to say this morning that there has never been uh, a, more, a better time for gender budgeting in OECD countries. We have been uh, working on this issue for, for many, many years at the OECD, and uh, there has been many, many breakthroughs recently. Uh, so it is a very fortuitous moment to be taking this on because the environment is very positive. And I think the number one reason why the environment is so positive is that there is a much greater understanding of what gender budgeting is. Uh, many people have a view, a certain view of gender budgeting, that it is about creating a separate his or her budget with equal amounts uh, for his, his and her, that it should be divided equally. That was a very... Uh, a very common understanding of what was meant by gender budgeting in the past, and that greatly hampered the advancement of gender budgeting. That discussion, as we've seen evidenced by the previous speakers, has advanced greatly in recent years. And the understanding is now, the more common understanding is that it is all about budget impact analysis, how different programs affect women and men differently. And that is an absolutely fundamental change in uh, the approach that people have about gender budgeting when you discuss it with them. The second thing is to highlight that it is not about the immediate budget outlays. It is very much about the secondary and third order effects of the budget. And if I take a simple example of a construction project, uh, you will have people working on the actual building site. There may well be more men than women on the actual building site. Uh, that is the first order effect, but countries need to move beyond that. Uh, you need to look at who are the beneficiaries of the project. Uh, is the actual construction, uh, the beneficiaries of that project, are they disproportionately men, or is there more, e or is there equality, or is it in fact focused more on women? And then the key to it is the third order effect. Uh, what does having this project in place allow for the overall outcomes, well-being and economic out, out, outcomes. So for example, and which is a key consideration when we're discussing gender budgeting, will, does it allow for a greater participation of women in the labor force? Because that brings me to the other point that I would like to highlight for why gender budgeting is now a more commonly discussed uh, and more advanced concept in OECD countries 
because the focus is very much increasingly on the economic effect, uh, the social justice aspect, the equality aspects, they are just taken as a given. They are accepted. Uh, the countries that are most advanced in this have moved beyond that to focus their arguments specifically on the economic aspects of gender budgeting. Most of our societies in OECD countries and in EU countries are facing with rapidly aging populations, such as shrinking labor force going forward, which is very much an economic, a key economic challenge facing our countries going forward. Using gender budgeting effectively to support policies that would allow for the greater participation of women in the labor market will, will uh, I mean, it depends in, in, in different countries, the effect is, but it can have an incredible impact on these long-term economic uh, models for these countries. So it is, uh, it is very much the key to the success and the acceptance of gender budgeting among a wider group of people is that uh, you take the social justice, you take the equality argument, that is just a given that everybody accepts, but to move it beyond that, you focus on the economic aspects of it. Now, if I move a little bit into some of the practical aspects uh, of, of doing this, uh, the budget community is also quite lucky in, in a sense that it has a culture of performance and results. There is a culture of evaluation. This is certainly the case uh, with, uh, with the European Union and regarding its spending. So gender budgeting and analyzing the gender impacts of budgets, it has a ready-made home. There is a community that is used to the terminology and concepts of evaluating, of performance, of evaluation. It is not anything brand new to this community. Uh, so that is an excellent starting point for, for countries. Now, when I say that there has never been a, a better time to be focusing on gender budgeting, I do not mean to say that it is easy. Uh, it is a journey uh, for countries to do this. Uh, we here at the OECD, our Senior Budget Officials Committee, we have a network of gender budgeting officials uh, that almost sort of provide inspiration for each other because it is not obvious with all, with all uh, government expenditure what the gender impact is. Uh, you almost need to overcome, you need to overcome a certain way of thinking uh, that uh, you would assume that certain aspects, there is no gender, certain programs, there is no gender aspect to them. But working together as a community, you start to see that you can, in fact, uh, even for infrastructure programs, see a, a distinctive uh, gender aspect to them. Uh, how countries are applying this in, in practice is generally that you require budget submissions uh, for new expenditure to have a gender impact statement, that this shows they have done the analysis of how the, the new budget proposal will impact uh, women and men differently. This is good by itself, of course, but it is also, it hardwires the gender issues into the policy process through the budget process, because it is all well and good to talk about gender issues, but as one of our, as one of our previous speakers said, the budget is all about turning words into action. And by having the budget submissions, a mandatory gender impact statement attached to them, you are hardwiring that into the policy process through the budget process. And that is a fundamental achievement in countries that are very advanced in this. Uh, the challenge here lies in the fact that this has largely been focused on new expenditure, the incremental new expenditures every year, that it's the baseline of existing expenditure which is the vast majority, of course, of total expenditure in countries, uh, the challenge is to apply this gender perspective to that. And we are now developing uh, at the OECD in cooperation with our countries ways of integrating a gender perspective into the spending review process that our countries have. And, uh, and just to conclude, sort of on the final challenge, and, and this was mentioned uh, by previous speakers, especially uh, uh, Director General Koopman is, is getting good data uh, on this information. Uh, gender disaggregated data is not, 
is not readily available in, in certain areas. There have been great strides made in this, mandating statistical offices to collect gender disaggregated data. But it's also that once we're going down this to take, uh, you know, don't let perfect be the enemy of the good. That, uh, you know, don't say we can't do this because we don't have perfect data. If you have data that is, uh, that you are confident that is giving you the right information, go with it rather than wait and with the, with the acknowledgement that this will improve over time. As I mentioned, it's a journey uh, rather than having the, the lack of, of complete data uh, stop you. So on that, I would like to conclude. I thank you again, and I apologize for the technical issues, but uh, it's, uh, countries are at different, are different places in moving down the gender budgeting uh, journey. But uh, I think this is something that we are all very much committed to. And there are a lot of success stories out there that can inspire all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Jan, for your presentation. Uh, I need to say that without image, the interpret can't uh, interpret, so uh, we have not uh, the English, the French interpretation. Uh, but uh, I wish that uh, everybody could understand uh, uh, the presentation of uh, Mr. Jan uh, Bondal. Um, the OECD has uh, identified, as uh, Mr. Uh, Bondal said, uh, gender budgeting as a key tool of a system-wide government approach to deliver gender equality outcomes and has defended that uh, effective implementation of gender budgeting can help redress gender inequalities through raising awareness of how policies included in the budget impact people differently and uh, prioritizing projects that help uh, close gender gaps. So, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Um, uh, Bondal for your uh, presentation. And uh, before to move to the last speaker, I'd like to remember that uh, all the participants can uh, ask the floor, uh, raising your hand or in the chat or writing a question uh, in the chat. So I move to uh, Elena Moraes uh, Maceira. Um, and uh, I would like to give uh, the floor to you. Uh, Helena Moraes Maceira is uh, an official of the European Agency for Gender Equality. AG has been a key partner in the road for the developing of a methodology for gender mainstreaming in the EU budget. The agency has developed a section in its web page dedicated to gender mainstreaming and assists member states and civil servants to find out how gender equality relates to their respective area of work. It highlights gender challenge in 19 policy areas hanging from fisheries to culture and also develops recommendations on how to best address these challenges. Elena, welcome and thank you very much for your participation. The floor is yours for eight minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting Nega to this important webinar on gender mainstreaming in the EU budget. Thank you, Ms. Margarida Marquez, for, for your words and also to, to all the speakers as well. Um, I will start by focusing on the state of art or the implementation of the dual approach for gender e equality um, in the EU. Our research, AGES research, observe that in the period 2014-2020, uh, in the uh, previous MFF, within the most important EU investment programs, the EU funds under the Common Provision Regulation, the dual approach has been disappearing. There were very few targeted interventions, uh, mainly because there was not a single gender equality objective out of the thematic objectives, uh, 14 at that time, and there were only two priorities re related to gender equality. Also, also a gender equality was a horizontal principle. There was no institutionalized processes to include gender mainstreaming in all programs, and the lack of specific guidelines and gender mainstreaming requirements led to gender-blind funding. 
under the, the current MFF, under the MFF 21-27, gender equality is a horizontal principle across thematic priorities with no standalone quantitative target. And the novelty, as it has been already said, is the commitment to measure the contribution to gender equality objectives at program level through uh, a gender equality tracking methodology and the reporting of uh, the results uh, annually. In this uh, new budgetary cycle, the EU faces unprecedented challenges, as we all know. Uh, Aegis research evidence shows that COVID-19 has triggered a number of worrying trends that risk disrupting the improvements in gender equality that have been made over the past decades. Translated into budgetary uh, resources, this means that there are risks of negative gender equality impacts of expenditure if gender impact assessments are not considered in the implementation of the recovery strategies. So building on this evidence, AEG welcomes the efforts that the Commission, led by DG Budget, is putting in the development of a methodology to track gender equality expenditure in the EU budget, because indeed information on gender-related budgetary allocations is central to assessing the implementation of the horizontal principle of gender equality in the MFF. How to develop this methodology is a central question of today's webinar. And I will now focus on uh, five challenges that tracking systems, and more specifically, a system that focuses on gender equality poses and on possible mitigation uh, actions. And here I will turn a little bit uh, more uh, technical, but I think this was uh, also one of the aims of uh, today's uh, webinar. So the first uh, challenge and, and also uh, mitigation actions that I would uh, uh, discuss with you is the arbitrary setting of markers and the approximation of the calculations. Uh, for all us to know, a system to track gender equality spending in the MFF assesses and weights individual programs according to their estimated impact on gender equality objectives. To measure the contribution of programs towards gender equality, minimum and common criteria to assign the markers need to be established in full alignment with the EU framework for gender equality and international standards. Issuing, for example, clear guidelines on how to measure the relevance of gender equality should uh, or could be provided to avoid the arbitrarity setting of gender markers and achieve comparability of results. Here, it is very important to underline that gender expertise is crucial in the assessment of the gender relevance of the programs in order to ensure high quality implementation of those assessment procedures. Exante systems, simple, uh, simple systems sorry, that look at the budget proposals are only able to, to track relevant activities to a certain extent. Expose assessments and deeper analysis at the project level during the program implementation would help approximate real spending for gender equality on a more detailed and verified basis. The second risk is the subject, the risk of, uh, or challenge, is the risk of subjectivity and overestimation of expenditure. An overestimation or overreporting of gender equality expenditure can happen if gender equality markers are raised unduly. This is a common feature in systems attempting to track gender equality. Uh, once again, the requirements for demonstrating the relevance of the program or specific measures to uh, the objective being tracked, in this case gender equality, needs to be strict and interpreted by all officials in the same way. Clear guidance and definition of minimum standards is uh, advisable. The third challenge when it comes to gender equality is the do not harm approach. Some priorities could potentially work against gender equality objectives. One example is that in times of COVID-19, 
investment in sectors, in sectors with uh, high shares of male employment, such as the digital, energy, construction, and transport industries, might contribute to increasing gender gaps, such as inequalities in employment. So the possibility to use negative markers uh, to capture measures and projects that, of course, unintentionally could work against gender equality by reinforcing, for example, gender stereotypes and therefore widening the gender gaps could be explored. As gender mainstreaming is a transformative strategy to achieve gender equality, which is the overall objective of gender mainstreaming, as we know, or the overall aim, some methodologies for tracking expenditures on gender equality even consider negative markers for interventions that maintain st status quo in terms of gender inequalities. The fourth challenge I want to, to, to mention today is the overlaps between parallel priorities. Gender equality is multidimensional and interacts with other forms of inequality and grounds of discrimination. So to avoid an overestimation of, in this case, the EU commitment, one should be careful and very precise uh, when appraising gender equality commitments or the equality commitments as gender equality and other uh, policies facing discrimination, for example, support to minorities or to vulnerable population could be overlapping. The fifth uh, and final challenge I want to share with you is about the commitments for qualitative, quantitative uh, targets. In the EU, context, other tracking systems uh, developed for other um, horizontal priorities have been linked to a financial commitment in terms of quantitative target for expenditure allocated to the interventions that are deemed to contribute to the respective policy objectives. Setting overall targets uh, that could form part, uh, it's something that could form part of the second phase after the gender equality tracking system has been put into, put into practice. And once the corresponding quantitative information about the results of the system implementation has been collected. Earmarking funds have proved to be effective to increase the acceptability of the systems. To conclude, uh, the coronavirus pandemic has reminded us that gender equality is not a side issue. Effectively, mainstreaming gender into the EU budget process poses opportunities to maximize public policy interventions and resource allocation processes to advance gender equality, but also, as it has been said, this would result in longer term economic and social gains for the EU. EIGE congratulates the work of the Parliament and the Commission in this regard and reiterates its commitments to continue, continue supporting this process, provided that resources are available. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Elena. Uh, I remember that uh, you can ask the floor in the chat or uh, in the, on the raise hand in your uh, screen. And we have some uh, written questions. Uh, and uh, I start to read the first one. I don't know if Maria Stratigaki, Stratigaki, if you want the floor or if you prefer, I read the question is in the chat. Okay, I read the question. Gender budgeting obligation for RRF is very weak. There is no requirement for exempt review or formal conditionality rules for programs and projects to be funded. This permits some countries, like Greece, to neglect completely any relevant requirement. As in the case of gender budgeting of EU structural funds, only strict and clear rules can lead to some concrete results. Otherwise, there are always some other priorities to be served. I can understand very well your point. Uh, this is a question, uh, first of all, to uh, Mr. Uh, Koopman. Uh, and uh, I move to a second question uh, in the chat also. 
Um, in relation to the different financing programs, there are aspects related to the indicators and targets that have to be very well planned when we want to base an objective and transparent reading understanding of this specific theme. First, in terms of EC data, uh, databases, where beneficiaries are required to indicate information about their project, is this specific information request? Are the technicians from the different programs who monitor and evaluate these projects? And who subsequently report to the Commission able to determine indicators to provide a reading of gender budgeting uh, specifically? And um, a third question. Uh, this is more, uh, this is not a third question, this is an information that uh, the Committee of the Regions will organize also uh, a debate. So, I give the floor to um, Gertian to answer to the question, to these two questions, and uh, if anyone wants to take the floor, uh, a panelist, you can uh, uh, take the floor uh, uh, afterwards. Uh, Mr. Kupen, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Margarita. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Marquez, and, and thank you for the questions. Um, as far as the RRF is concerned, I uh, already, I think, indicated that the uh, requirements uh, in the regulation uh, are uh, to be considered, in my view, as a first step towards uh, uh, gender uh, budgeting. But clearly, uh, the weaknesses which the uh, 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 chat uh, uh, has, has identified, so the question in the chat has identified, are, are, are real. I'm not uh, pretending that uh, this is a uh, fully fledged uh, and satisfactory uh, uh, system uh, because the scrutiny on the uh, actual implementation is limited and the possibilities to uh, validate uh, technically uh, uh, even the ex ante uh, indications is also uh, somewhat limited. I think we need to recognize the conditions under which the RRF was put in place, um, and we need, uh, I think, to accompany the implementation over the next years by emphasizing the importance of this matter and following it up at uh, all the necessary uh, levels. But we need to be realistic. The regulation doesn't require the minimum necessary inputs to have a top-class, fully-fledged uh, gender uh, budgeting uh, uh, framework for this tool. So um, we, we should, uh, in my view, and I, I come now to the second point, recognize that if we do this seriously, it is a matter of a change in culture, a uh, process where we will need to build an infrastructure uh, that is not going to be achieved in uh, a few uh, months or even a few years. So. I think what is essential for the methodology that we develop is that, uh, as the question uh, uh, identifies, uh, the people who will have to follow up and implement it are actually uh, equipped with the necessary information and are properly trained. And this is very much what we are aiming for, uh, as I have uh, already uh, explained. So uh, the pilots which we will be running for the methodology will need to pay uh, due attention to this and the people involved with it, with, with it uh, in terms of its implementation will need to receive the necessary uh, training. So these are all very important points uh, of attention which are, uh, I can uh, assure you, very much on our radar screen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gertian. I'd like also to thank uh, Claudia Teixeira Gomes and Maria Stratigaki, the who asked the, the, the previous questions. Uh, and uh, I move to my colleague, Maria Manuel Leiton Marques. Maria Manuel, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Margarida. Thank you, first of all, for the organization of this important debate with so many people interested in this subject. In fact, as we see the uh, told before, we, uh, all of us have been working for many years in this subject, but we need to recognize 
without uh, the results we want to achieve. And uh, for the moment, I think it's not a problem of, of lack of, of political will. Is probably a problem, a technical problem, a problem of methodology uh, to uh, to put forward our objectives. And uh, the first of all, I would like to uh, to refer the lack of uh, of data to do this job. Um, we, in frequent meetings uh, this week, uh, we have had with, uh, in farm committee with EDGE, with the European Institute for Gender Equality, there has been an unanimous recognition that there is a lack of data about existing gender inequality, such as in terms of pay, but not only in terms of, uh, of pay. Uh, uh, and uh, so to apply gender budgeting, we will need uh, assessment studies, and therefore the budget of European Institute for Gender Equality must be increased so that uh, we have better uh, statistical uh, data to support our decisions. I, I, we need to recognize it's not for gender equality. Uh, for instance, if you want to have uh, something similar to New Zealand on well-being, uh, that is measure the impact of the budget in terms of well-being, uh, also we need uh, more, um, that includes gender equality, uh, we need uh, uh, better uh, data, more data and better data. And um, uh, second, uh, gender budgeting methodology, while important, uh, uh, still lack the recognition in many member states. It is not the case of Portugal, that there is another problem, but uh, not this one. Uh, so uh, um, my question is how we, we are working together with member states in this process. And finally, um, in Portugal, there is a problem, probably it's not a problem of you, but I would like to know, uh, that is our budget is organized in spending categories or addings. And uh, this makes us more difficult to apply a gender perspective. We are trying to move to a budget organized by programs. Uh, is this also a problem at EU level, a technical problem or not? This is my question. Thank you very much to all the speakers and, of, of course, to Margarida and SND for organizing this meeting. Thank you, Maria Manuel. Uh, this is, uh, you raised a, a key point, and this is clear in the report of the CURT of auditors that I mentioned. Uh, only 21.7% of the EU programs had gender related indicators. So we need to improve, to increase this, this, uh, this figure. And I think also that the CURT of auditors uh, um, gave uh, interesting recommendations to the Commission uh, to, to, to have a better performance on that uh, subject, on this subject. So uh, now uh, I, I have two questions, two written questions, and I will uh, read them. The first is, what is your position on the question of categorizing budget programs according to which categories should EU programs be classified in the future in order to measure uh, and evaluate the gender dimension, harming, stable, improving? And this question can be to AG and the Commission. And the last question also to the Commission, please could you elaborate on the question how to integrate the gender perspective into performance-based budgeting and what would be your suggestions for uh, improvement. So I give the floor to Gertien and after I give the floor to the other speakers. Gert, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you uh, very much for those questions. Maybe on the first one, I would say that uh, uh, a sustained investment in uh, capacity building is going to be necessary. I've already emphasized that in the Commission, but not just in the Commission, uh, also uh, uh, with the member states who are, as you know, responsible for uh, assisting with the implementation of two-thirds of the uh, EU budget. And uh, I would say that uh, strong capacity building in the two arms of the budgetary authority is also necessary. Uh, I see AGA playing an important role, and as, as I indicated already, 
providing uh, very precious uh, support uh, to us in, in, in terms of uh, training programs and, and strategic advice. I think on this question of uh, whether um, the assessment on a program by program level is, 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 is problematic from a gender perspective, I would actually say it helps because whilst we will clearly have um, a methodology that is uh, going to apply to all programs, I'm sure that the depth uh, of the uh, assessments will vary a little bit in function uh, of the programs and the extent to which we can really drill deeper will depend on programs in terms of uh, their uh, uh, gender relevance. Not just the first order effects as Mr. Bondel from, from the OECD has mentioned, but also further downstream. So, um, you know, with, with the limited resources, uh, uh, any, any uh, budget uh, implementation body has uh, uh, having uh, a series of programs that are particularly per, uh, pertinent on the radar and being able to drill deeper there is going to be important. I should say that in the other tracking approaches we follow, uh, for example, in biodiversity, we, we do very much the same, uh, uh, so that overall uh, we concentrate our uh, resources, obviously based on uh, a consistent uh, cross-budget methodology on those programs where it uh, matters most. Now, building that capacity, as I indicated, will be a matter of, uh, of years. Uh, the pilots I have referred to for direct management programs will be uh, advanced as much as we can. And I think once we actually do this uh, concretely, we, we will have a different type of debate because then it will become a matter of assessing something that the Commission has put forward, which is currently uh, not yet available. Final point from my side, tracking expenditure is only the beginning uh, of uh, a performance-based uh, uh, budgeting approach because obviously we will have to work through all the way to effects, to impact and results. Um, and that is uh, an even more relevant uh, uh, and, and pertinent uh, uh, endpoint uh, for, for, for our assessment, which will have to build on these steps. We first need to know what we're actually spending, we will then need to have proper evaluation uh, and we will have to have um, indicators built into uh, uh, the uh, frameworks that allow us to actually do this uh, assessment. At the end of the day, the objective more generally uh, uh, of DG Budget is to be sure that performance related information feeds back into the budget cycle so that programs that are not delivering can be uh, addressed, can be uh, improved, or, or if they cannot be improved, then their budget allocation has to be reduced, whereas programs that perform very well should be, be prioritized. That's ultimately the budget cycle we want, uh, uh, and that uh, uh, is clearly something which will help the budget address uh, policy priorities more fully. Uh, we are at the start of a journey to achieve this as far as gender is concerned, but we're very clear about where we want to end. Thank you. Thank you, Gert, for your reaction. So I move to the OECD. Uh, Mr. Bondal, you have the floor. If you want to react. Back up uh, so, or reiterate and agree with the comments that have been made that uh, it uh, moving from an you know an input based budget to a program based to a, a performance and results based budgeting is is of course a key to this and and that will allow us to uh, to more easily and more readily uh, implement gender budgeting I think my my main comment here is uh, I, I sense that uh, that uh, there, there is we talk about uh, developing capacity which I very much agree with. But I, I think it's also key that we need to have this mainstreamed in the budget process, that this becomes one of the features of performance budgeting in general, that we don't create a separate system for, for gender budgeting, because uh, it may give a boost at the very beginning, but it's probably not very sustainable. I think a much better investment is the existing performance and results budgeting systems to incorporate this into them. As I mentioned, there is a culture of evaluation. There is a, a culture of all of these assessments. And just to add this perspective to that, 
rather than creating uh, a separate uh, apparatus just focused on, on gender issues. Uh, I think that would be my, my, uh, my main comment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Bondal. So uh, now I give the floor to Helena Moraes Maceira if you want to react to the, to answer to one question and to react to the others if you wish. Mrs. Moraes Maceira, if you can please press the speak button one time. Oh, yes, sorry. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, just to react to the uh, question of the specific, uh, specific categories, the markers and so on. Um, um, well, I would say that uh, as this is already, um, it turns into a very, very uh, technical discussion because we would need to go one, one by one and uh, assess the different options. Maybe just to reiterate that um, um, it would be important to uh, ensure the, the, that um, the proposals are fully aligned with the framework for gender equality and the international standards uh, in this regard. And for from and then of course lessons learned from previous experiences and markets. That, that, that have been used um, before by, by other countries or organizations. And for example, I just uh, introduced the, the aspect of possibility to use or to track to capture also uh, negative impact impacts in terms of um, increasing gender inequalities or um, um, yeah, or, or even the weight that we would do. To, we would do or we would give so we would give sorry to those uh, programs that do not have um, an objective to advance gender equality, but rather just uh, keep the the status quo in terms of, of gender inequalities. So this is our, those are more um, fundamental uh, aspects from the perspective of um, uh, international standards. And what it would be very important once the 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 uh, let's say the the markers are agreed and the categories, final categories are agreed, is that um, those are accompanied by, uh, for example, minimum standards, uh, common criteria to assign those markers, clear guidelines um, on how to really measure the, the relevance of gender equality to make sure that um, then the results are comparable and are sound. And here, of course, as it has been said uh, before, uh, gender expertise uh, would be crucial in the assessment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elena. So we arrived at uh, the end of the q and uh, point. So I move to the last point, the conclusion. Uh, and uh, I give the floor to uh, Evelyn Reiner. Uh, Evelyn, uh, she's Austrian. She's an Austrian MEP and chair of the FAM committee. Uh, equality, equality matters and gender mainstreaming are very close to Evelyn Hart. Evelyn, please go ahead. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. And really a big thank you, Margarita, for organizing this event today, which is so important. I would like to sum up very briefly, sum up, of course, what you said, but sum up uh, as the conclusions. We need both. We need a political strategy of the Commission towards all the European institutions, including all the European institutions. So a political strategy, including everything what you have mentioned right now. And we need to be detailed, very precise, because it has to be appreciated so much of what you, Margarita, have done, what I dare of uh, during the RFF, MFF negotiations, so much to include gender equality, but gender equality must not remain only a title. It has to be, as the title of this today's uh, uh, debate shows, uh, included into a strategy with a methodology that is really going straight ahead. So, starting points, the ECA uh, report, which was really more or less uh, uh, very, very critical and saying a lot has to be done. And uh, you were all referring to, uh, to it right now. We are aware, I mean, when we're talking about gender equality, we're talking about fundamental rights, we're talking about uh, a core value, we're talking about really Article 2, 3 of the European Treaty, and most of you have referred to that in your uh, presentations. But a lot has to be done yet, and uh, 
I think everybody of us has studied quite well what the ECA was uh, uh, demanding from the European uh, institutions. So we're in mid of the whole issue of how the methodology, sh uh, methodology should look like. So therefore, of course, congratulations to the Commission that we have, uh, uh, and Mr. Copeland was showing all the gender equality strategy, I mean, the, 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 the tracking issues, so you showed very, very well what has been done by the Commission, and we would like to support that also what Helena Dali, uh, our Commissioner, was referring to, that yes, we have the task force, yes, the Commission is developing a methodology, uh, and uh, asks the member states uh, to uh, take gender equality at the heart of the national uh, action plans. But we have to be blunt. I mean, that's all nice. We know about how uh, me member states are more or less blurring and uh, putting maybe the topic of gender equality into the title, but then when it's coming to the methodology, then they are just getting weaker. And insofar, uh, it was highly to be appreciated on the clear messages you were giving us to us, Mr. Copeland, right now uh, on how the, uh, the, the tracking of gender expenditure uh, uh, work is starting, but you mentioned it as well too. This is uh, a first step. It's not perfect. And when we are looking right now at the national action plans, I can already say uh, to you, member states again are uh, forgetting. And therefore, uh, it is so important that develop exactly not only the tracking approach in the budget, but as our fantastic colleague from AIGE, as always, is presenting, uh, 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 presenting uh, this has to go into the detail. So somehow, uh, when we look uh, at the uh, uh, at the whole at how the whole system uh, should uh, look like, so clear guidelines on how to measure gender equality, the poss possibility to track the negative marker and, of course, the financial commitment on targets. Because when right now looking at the next year's European budget, I just can tell you most of the committees, even in the European Parliament, are uh, not emphasizing enough uh, gender equality. Uh, Mr. Blond from OECD mentioned it's the best moment right now because the commitment uh, is already existing in the heads. So we are talking now not about if we are doing gender budgeting, if we are going into gender mainstreaming and the methodology, the question is how, how intensive. And therefore, I just would like to sum up what uh, uh, most of you mentioned right now. It's about data, gender disaggregate, uh, disaggregated data. So Eige, we need you more than ever. Commission, please do your job. Training, because it's important. It's not important, it's essential that uh, in the European institutions, Commission, Parliaments, uh, Council get this training in order to use the tools we are proposing right now, but above all also to include, include member states. Because here again it is, when you just look at national action plans or uh, 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 in the whole MFF, yes, so much money when we're talking, for example, about financing remote uh, areas is again going in restoring uh, streets and classic men's jobs, which is important, okay, but what about uh, these effects, especially women have uh, with the COVID crisis in the care sector, which we need so much to uh, be uh, built on, and all this has to be reflected uh, in the tools. So uh, I sum up again, we need a political strategy of the European Commission. So not only bits and pieces, as we have it right now, fantastic members of the European Parliament, uh, dedicated uh, 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 functionnaires in the Commission, European institution, fighters for women's rights in the uh, NGOs. This has to be included by the Commission as a political strategy, including the instruments that have been uh, presented today. And I can ensure you're in the FAM committee and, of course, also uh, in the uh, Gender Mainstreaming Network, we'll fight for that. So thank you very much for uh, really going into detail because uh, one thing is the political strategy. Yes, it is needed, but then it has to be really precise because otherwise in the, in the, in the funds and the programs of the European uh, 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 Union, somehow it won't be reflected. And it 
has to, because we would like to get a plus, plus, plus from the next ECA's uh, report when it's about gender mainstreaming. Merci, Evelyn. Merci pour uh, ton... Thank you, Evelyn. Thank you for your comments and thank you for the ongoing work which we've had uh, from the very beginning between the, the Budget Committee and, and the Women's Committee. I think we should continue to work together to um, develop further and to achieve uh, our aims, the aim that we set out uh, in the MFF uh, um, negotiations. Equally, we also need to work as programmes are uh, implemented. We shouldn't wait till 2027 to be able to draw the conclusions um, to understand that we've made very little progress. We need to uh, 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 insist that uh, uh, these programmes can be developed throughout the entire lifetime of the uh, seven-year budget of the MFF. So I'd like to thank Mr. Koopman, uh, Mr. Jean Blondel and Ms. Uh, Macieira uh, and uh, Evelyn d'avoir accepted. Thank you to Helen and Evelyn as well. Thank you for being involved in this debate. Uh, this has been a very inspiring debate. We came up with a number of ideas about how to move forward with the ability to use the EU's budget to progress. Um, our aims towards uh, women's participation in the economy, in the world of culture, etc., etc. We need to include all of these aspects. We need to work together. And I think we uh, work well together between uh, the, uh, the Socialists who are in the Budget Committee and the Women's Committee. Now, before I close the debate, I'd like to give the floor to Commissioner Daly, please. Un petit détail. Unfortunately, uh, Commissioner uh, Daly uh, had to leave the meeting already, but I would like to thank uh, the Commissioner for having shared um, her thoughts uh, on the issue, what's at stake and what's on her agenda as the Commissioner uh, responsible for gender equality. I'd like to thank everyone for your participation in this webinar and hopefully in the next uh, meeting we organise on this uh, topic we will be able to have um, physical presence, people actually in the room, um, but uh, this time uh, we had to limit uh, this to an online uh, panel. Uh, so thank you to everyone, thank you to all the panellists, thank you to the participants and I'd like to say you, you have um, given us some very important contributions so that we can continue with our work. So thank you once again and I wish you a good weekend. <laughs>